Flip over, if you would, to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're going to come back to Revelation 13. But let's look quickly at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And what I want to preach to you about tonight is the devil's master plan for the end times. The devil's master plan for the end times. What is he doing? I, you know, I've done a lot of sermons on Bible prophecy. A lot of them were devoted to just attacking the, the fallacy of the pre-trib rapture and just exposing that for the fraud that it is. And obviously I've done, you know, the Revelation whole series where I went through and preached each chapter in uh, the book of Revelation and so forth. But I want to just fill in a few gaps tonight and just give a big picture of what is the devil doing in our world today in these last days. And as we get into the final days, what is the master plan? What is the, what is the overarching design behind it? Look what the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, which is obviously a reference to the rapture when we will be gathered together, caught up together with him in the clouds, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. And of course, this, you know, just very quickly tells us that this teaching that Jesus Christ can return at any moment is a lie and that the day of Christ at hand, that's not really true. There are all these other things that happen, have to happen first. And the Bible says that uh, the, the falling away is going to come first. Now, what is that falling away that's going to come first? Well, it is apostasy. It is people falling away from the faith and turning from the truth unto fables. And the Bible says in verse 4, that right after saying that the son of perdition, the man of sin, will be revealed, it says in verse 4, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, before the day of Christ comes, the Bible is telling us very clearly that there's going to be a man known as the man of sin or the son of perdition. This man will oppose and exalt himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. So this man of sin, this son of perdition will claim to be God. He will claim divinity and he will seat himself in the temple and claim to be God. Uh, let's keep reading. It says in verse 5, Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? So this is something that Paul had already preached to the Thessalonians while he was there. They'd heard a sermon audibly about this. Now he's just writing it to them because they'd gotten a little bit confused on it and he wants to set the record straight. And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Letting means hindering, okay? And so when it says he who now let, it's talking about he who is hindering, which has to do with the withholding in verse 6. It says he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this God, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So this man that's going to claim to be God and he's going to declare that unto all men and he's going to be seated in the temple, the Bible says that he, his coming is after the power of Satan with all si power and signs and lying wonders. Now, what are wonders in the Bible? What's a more common word that we would use for that? Miracles, miracles right? So this man, through the means of miracles and power that he has, is going to deceive the people that dwell upon the earth. And then, you know, ultimately he's going to be destroyed by the Lord Jesus Christ. But one thing I want to point out here is in verse 7 where the Bible says, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. 
And keep in mind, this was being written all the way back in the first century AD. This is almost 2,000 years ago, and the Bible is saying, the mystery of iniquity doth already work. So, this working toward this Antichrist being in power, and that's who we're reading about, the Antichrist, that is a biblical term that God uses, was already, that spirit of Antichrist was already at work even back in the days of the Apostle Paul. Go to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. And obviously, if it was already at work back then, then we know that it is working today. These things are happening around us. You say, well, why is this relevant to preach about this? Uh, uh, what if we're not in that generation? Or what if this happens after we're gone? No, the mystery of iniquity already works. Right. And so we need to be able to see this and understand this and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. It says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, Little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist, that singular, shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. So he's saying even now there are Antichrists. Flip over, if you would, to 1 John chapter 4, just a, a couple chapters to the right there. And the Bible says, And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist. Notice that term, the spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. So the thing that I really want to drive in with this is that today there is already a spirit of Antichrist in this world, and there is already a mystery of iniquity that is at work today that is taking this world to the point where the Antichrist will be the supreme leader and where all nations will worship him and he will declare himself to be God on earth. Go, if you would, to Revelation 13 with all that in mind. Let's look at this chapter. This is uh, the key chapter about the Antichrist in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 13, verse 1, the Bible reads, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Now, I don't have time to delve into this too much because I'm trying to give kind of an overview. But these animals that are listed there do have significance when we go back to the book of Daniel, okay? And we don't have time to delve into the book of Daniel tonight. But in the book of Daniel, these same beasts are mentioned. And these beasts are mentioned in the context of these great empires of man that were taking over huge portions of the world. And if you remember, Daniel received a vision that there would be that Babylonian empire followed by the Medo-Persian empire, followed by the Greek empire, empire and then ultimately followed by the Roman Empire and that Roman Empire was in power at the first coming of our Lord Jesus Christ when Jesus came to this earth Rome is at rule and you remember how when Jesus Christ was born in that Christmas story that we've heard so many times in Luke 2 that Caesar Augustus gives a decree that the whole world should be taxed I mean, you have a lot of power when you're making a decree that the whole world should be taxed, okay? So, what the Bible shows us in Daniel and even into the New Testament with that world empire of the Roman Empire is basically a prototype or a foreshadowing of the global government that Satan will once, one day institute upon this earth. So, in Daniel, we have a foreshadowing of that. The Babylonian Empire represents that. And the Roman Empire represents that. That's why even in the book of Revelation, we're reading about Babylon. Because it's that spirit of Antichrist, that spirit of a one world global government and global religion. This is often popularly referred to in 2015 as the New World Order. That's kind of become the buzzword for a global government. Okay, And you say, well, what, what does this have to do with global government? Well, let's keep reading. And I just want to point out, though, then in verse 2, the, the beast here ties in with those world empires of Daniel chapter 
2 and elsewhere in Daniel. But it says in verse number 3, And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. Obviously, the dragon is Satan. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. This is global government when one man has power over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. One man in power over all nations equals global government. Because they're all under his rule. That's what we mean when we say that the Bible teaches that there will one day be a one world government. Okay. Now, when you look at this uh, uh, scripture, sometimes you can read it and become confused just because there's so much talk about the beast and the seven heads and the ten horns. It can seem to be cryptic and difficult to understand. But what you have to understand is that when the Bible talks about this beast, it's, it's not just talking about one person, but it's talking about a whole system, the whole government structure. That's why there are seven heads and ten horns, okay? But then one of those heads is wounded to death, okay? That's the singular person. So when the Bible talks about the beast here, it's talking about, in one sense, this great worldwide global kingdom, but then it is also used to refer to the single man, the son of perdition, the man of sin, the Antichrist, that one of the heads that basically has the deadly wound that is healed. So basically, out of this one world system, there's going to be one guy who basically receives a deadly wound, and that deadly wound is going to be healed. And when that deadly wound is going to be healed, this man is going to be worshipped by the entire world, okay? Now, you can see why this man will be worshipped after his deadly wound is healed because of the fact it, that we know that this man is known as the Antichrist elsewhere in Scripture, in 1 John and 2 John. So, if he's called the Antichrist, what does that mean? That means that he is impersonating Jesus Christ. And what did Jesus Christ do to prove and authenticate that he was the Son of God. He died, he was buried, and he rose again. This is a counterfeiting of that. The deadly wound is healed. Now, you can say, well, it doesn't say he died. It just says he got a deadly wound and it was healed. First of all, the world would not wonder about that. The world would not be amazed by someone receiving a deadly wound and not dying. Because there are often people that you hear about in the news who get shot right in the face, shot right in the head, and, and everybody thinks they're doomed and they end up pulling through. That's not really that amazing. Go to Revelation 17, just a few pages to the right in your Bible. We'll come back to chapter 13. But look over at Revelation 17, verse 8, and let's get another clue about this uh, beast or antichrist, or man of sin, or son of perdition, all terms for the same person. It says in verse 8, the beast that thou sawest was and is not. Now, you have to understand when you're reading the Bible, it'll often use the term is not to refer to someone who is not alive. Right. Like, for example, back in Genesis, when Joseph had been sold into slavery, but his father thought he was dead, his father said this, Joseph is not meaning he no longer is alive. He no longer exists on this earth. And so when it says, the beast that thou sawest was and is not, meaning he's dead, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder. Why are they wondering? Well, because he was, and then he is not, and then he ascends out of the bottomless pit. And then it says, that they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written on the book of life from the foundation of the world. When they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. Now, we may not be able to fully understand what is being described here, but I can tell you one thing for sure. He receives a deadly wound. He dies. He goes to hell and somehow is brought back or somehow is revivified. You know, we don't know the exact details of how it's going to play out. That is what the world finds amazing. 
That is part of how he deceives them that dwell on the earth. This is one of the signs and wonders that he works in order to deceive those that dwell on the earth. And he gives us a little bit of a hint here in verse 9. He says, Here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings. Five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, see how it keeps emphasizing that? Even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest, remember how that beast had seven heads and ten horns? It says, the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. So what do we see here? We see ten men who are ten great world leaders, ten kings as it were, who will then all vote unanimously to relinquish their own sovereignty and their own power and to just give all the power unto the Antichrist. Just ten leaders that will give all the power. They'll have one mind and they'll be in total agreement. Yes, this is our savior. This is our leader. We're going to give him all the power. Is the picture starting to come clear for you? Go back to Revelation 13. I'm just trying to simplify this because uh, some people become confused by the, 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 the different uh, uh, sim symbolism here of the, you know, the beast and the horns and the heads. But uh, back to chapter 13 where we were. It said in verse 7, It was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. So he is persecuting God's people. Now, the saints are the saved. That's what it means to be a saint. You can study that all through Scripture. There are plenty of Scriptures you could use to prove that saints are people that are saved, people who have been sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ once for all are known as saints. For example, I mean, just one place out of scores of places we could turn, but uh, this popped into my mind, 1 Corinthians 1, 2, where it says, "...unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours." So all people in every place who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ are saints. That's just one scripture. We go to many others. So who is it that the Antichrist is making war with? He is making war with the saints, the saved, true believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, those who have called upon the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, let me just stop and mention what the word Antichrist means, because a lot of people misunderstand this word. We have a prefix in modern English, anti, and it means that you're against something, right? If I said I'm anti-abortion or anti-vaccine or anti-war, what does that mean? I'm against those things, okay? But that is not what the anti in Antichrist means. That is a modern prefix. That is not a prefix that is ancient, okay? That is something that is in our modern English tongue. And in fact, the prefix anti in the Bible, okay, because this is a Greek word, antichrist. It's taken directly from Greek straight into English, you know, antichristos to just antichrist. And it means one that is in the place of Christ. That's what, it, that's what that prefix means. So we don't want to become confused by the modern anti definition and lose sight of what the antichrist is, okay? For example, a place where this word is used is where it talks about how when Jesus went down into Egypt in Matthew chapter 2 as a baby and grew up there as a young child, not a baby, but a young child. And then when he comes back, it says that his father Joseph heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea in the room of his father Herod, in place of his father. That is anti, is what the word is there. So what it's saying here, antichrist is saying, in the place of Christ, a substitute for Christ, a different Christ, not Jesus Christ, but a different Christ, someone who is in his place. Of course, Jesus said, many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. And then there are many antichrists, but then there's going to be one big antichrist someday who pretends to be Jesus Christ. Let's keep reading. It says in verse Eight, all that, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. Let's jump down for sake of time. Verse 11, and I beheld another beast 
coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles. Sound familiar? Remember all the lying signs and wonders it said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2? Not only is he uh, brought back from the bottomless pit, but now he has this false prophet, okay, that basically uh, preaches before him and prophesies before him basically a false John the Baptist to point people unto him, okay? This is the anti-John, all right, is what we'll call him. And then this guy is performing miracles where he brings down fire from heaven in the sight of men on the earth. Sort of like Elijah called down fire from God. And if you remember the children of Israel, when they saw Elijah bring down fire from heaven, they said, oh, the Lord, he's the God. But you know, why did they need to see that? You know, we're supposed to just believe God's word. And it's a wicked and adulterous generation that seeketh after a sign. Right. You know, the Bible says the Jews seek after a sign. The Greeks seek after wisdom. And we preach Christ crucified. It's an offense unto both. Because we don't believe in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ because of a sign. And we don't believe in it because of the wisdom of this world. We believe in it by faith. And faith cometh by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. Amen. But these weak Israelites that did not have faith, when they saw fire come down, and, and they're, you know, if that fire would have come down for Baal, they would have worshipped Baal. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they would have. They would have worshipped Satan right then and there. You know, but then, you know, Elijah brings down the fire. But, but there were 7,000 men who already had not bowed the knee to the image of Baal before Elijah ever brought down any fire. They just believed it by faith in the word of God. Okay. And so that's uh, something that we see here, the deception of false miracles, lying signs and wonders. The Bible warns of this in, in the book of Deuteronomy, that, that a false prophet would come along and do wonders and do miracles and believe him not. Some of it is through sleight of hand, and some of it is through the power of Satan. But the Bible says that he deceiveth them, verse 14, that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score, and six. Now, in order for this all to play out, there are things at work right now to bring this to pass because the mystery of iniquity doth already work. The spirit of Antichrist is even now already in the world. And so this is where our evil world is headed today. And in order for this story in Revelation 13 to play out, there are some things that are going to have to happen first. In order for 10 kings to give all the power unto the Antichrist, what do you have to have? You have to have a global system of government in place for the Antichrist to take the helm. You're not just gonna go overnight from just every nation being completely separate and completely sovereign to just being all united overnight. No, they're already starting to unite right now. And the, the world government is already in its embryonic stage and it's known as the United Nations. And that embryonic world government has to be there in order for this to play out. Not only that, but in order to keep anyone from buying or selling without a mark in their right hand or in their forehead, you must have a cashless society. You see, if you don't have a cashless society, how can you stop people from buying or selling? People do all kinds of illegal buying and selling every day and no one can stop them because they use cash. You can buy drugs, you can buy illegal weapons, you can buy whatever you want, but you're going to be paying cash. And if they said, hey, you can't buy or sell, but you can produce gold or silver or cash, then could they really stop you from buying or selling? No, you got the black market going. But if there's no cash, if it's all electronic, if it's all on a card, 
If it's all credit, it's all PayPal, it's all Visa, it's all MasterCard, it's all uh, an electronic debit from your account, then it could easily be rolled out to where you can't buy or sell without a mark in your right hand or in your forehead. So these are the things that we already see happening around us preparing for this world system. So economically, what does this look like? A one world currency where all of the monetary systems have been connected to where you get a mark in your right hand or in your forehead and you can't buy or sell without that mark. And cash will no longer be of any value. Now, why would the cash be of any value? It's a piece of paper. The only reason that that piece of paper that you call a dollar bill has any value is because we think it has value. As long as we have confidence in it and think it has value, it will be worth something. But as soon as the government just says, your, your bills are no longer worth anything, they won't be worth anything. I mean, if the government came out today and said, I'm sorry, but every Federal Reserve note is now null and void. You could go to the store, you could go to your buddy and offer them stacks of $100 bills and they're not gonna take it because they're gonna say this stuff is worthless, it's trash, it's a piece of paper, what good is it? You're trying to get real goods from me, this is worthless money. Now this has already happened before. For example, I mean all throughout history this has happened. You know, for example in Germany after World War I, when the inflation was driven up so high that literally wheelbarrows of, of money were needed to buy a loaf of bread. They just kept adding zeros and zeros onto the end of the German currency. Not only that, but the Confederate States of America was defeated by the United States of America, and then the Confederate States of America money was declared to be worthless. And so you have paper money that has zero value, and people saved up a bunch of Confederate money stuffed in the mattress, and it's worth nothing. Why? Because it's paper. It has no real intrinsic value. And so that's what we see with the economic system of a cashless society. We see the banking system in place to facilitate these electronic transactions. I mean, we're already there to the point where this story could play out. I'm not saying that this is going to happen in the next year or two. I don't know when this could happen. It could happen in the next few years. It could happen 100 years from now. We don't know. Everybody thinks it's always in their generation. But I'll say this, we have the technology for everything in this story to play out now. Right. It's already there. It could easily shut off access to you know, paper money transactions and just say, hey, it's all electronic. I mean, now people can take credit cards on their small phone. You go to a lot of businesses now, and it's the trendy thing for them to come to your table with like an iPhone. Who's ever been to a restaurant where they took your credit card on an iPhone? literally, at a, at a big restaurant. Yeah, I've been seeing it lately. We've, we've gone places where the, the waitress will just whip out an iPhone and just jit, and just scan your deal and, uh, and, and, and you pay right there at, with a card. But you know what, what do we need cards for? Because cards can be stolen and lost. Why not just get it in your hand and then just you've paid. So that's where this is all going economically. We see where it's going politically where the Europeans have already, and I mean, look, if anybody has hated each other and fought each other historically, it was these European nations. Think about all the wars over the last few thousand years, right? Where the European nations have fought and fought and hated each other and fought and fought and fought. And now we see them all united in the European Union. And they're joining together in that conglomerate. We already have the United Nations. We have the lone superpower, the United States that literally has bases everywhere. I mean, almost every nation in the world is subservient unto the United States. We give money to almost every country in the world. You know, you hear about foreign aid, how our country gives money to almost every country in the world. Why? Because the one who pays the bills is the one who makes the rules. And when you accept people's money, there are strings attached. That's why our country, you say, why does our country give all this money away? We're in debt up to our eyeballs. Why? Just, to, just to show our power, just to dominate them. Okay, why? Because we are the headquarters of the world government in you know, New York and the United Nations and so forth. We, I mean, we're the, the main sponsor behind the United Nations as a nation. So we see what's happening monetarily. We see what's happening politically. But what is the devil's plan spiritually? That's what I want to talk about now. What is the spiritual plan here? Because in order to get all nations and all kindreds and all tongues to worship 
this man, the Antichrist, he's going to have to basically create a religion that everybody can agree on. Isn't that right? I mean, if you're going to get Hindus to worship this guy, you're going to get Buddhists to worship this guy, you're going to get Muslims to worship this guy, Jews, Christians, all, and, and I use the term Christian loosely because the Bible says that none of the elect will be deceived. No true believer in the Lord Jesus Christ will be deceived. But there are a lot of people who think that they're a Christian and they're not. There's a lot of false Christianity out there, apostate Christianity, that will be deceived. The unsaved False Christians will believe on the Antichrist. Now, who is the Antichrist? Because what, what is this going to look like? Because, and you say, well, why speculate? What does it matter? Because the mystery of iniquity doth already work. That's why. Amen. And let me tell you something. The, the spirit of Antichrist and the mystery of iniquity that is bringing us toward this financial system of the end And it's bringing us toward this political system of the end. Let me tell you something. It is at work in churches today to bring us toward a one world religion. And that spirit is already infiltrated into even Baptist churches, Christian churches, non-denominational churches to bring us into conformity with this religion that's coming, this worldwide global religion. Right. It's funny, my wife was in Costco today And this guy was behind her in line. He kind of pressured her to, to let him go first because he had less stuff than my wife, you know, because she's buying a lot of stuff because, you know, we have a big family. So she's at Costco, and this guy starts talking to John about how sharp he's dressed, and he must be at church this morning. And he asked him, you know, about church. And John said, well, my dad's a pastor, you know, Faithful Word Baptist Church. And this guy said, oh, I'm a pastor too. And this guy's church was called the Logos Center in Scottsdale. And he's explaining to my son that the Greek word Logos means word, which he already knew, but he was polite and pretended not to have already known. Because, you know, it's not polite to be a know-it-all. When people tell you things, you act like you're hearing them for the first time. That's a polite way to handle that. But he told him that, and, and he said, oh, check us out online. My wife pulled up on the phone. And this guy literally had all these symbols on the website showing like a cross, a yin-yang, you know, a star of Remphan, you know, the crescent of the Muslims, all the different symbols of the world. And he, he had a book for sale called Why Jesus Taught Reincarnation. And he's talking about giving psychic readings. And it's just this, this organization that's bringing all these religions together. And you know what? This is getting more and more common. You know, Baha'i faith. Have you heard of it? Yeah. It's a major religion today. And Baha'i faith is all about uniting all religions, taking something from Christianity, taking something from Judaism, taking something from Islam, and, and putting it all together, Buddhism, putting it all together. Another one of these religions that's out there that's trying to synthesize religion is the Nation of Islam. The Nation of Islam, you know, Louis Farrakhan and Elijah Muhammad, whatever they're called. But, you know, these guys with the newspapers and the sharp haircuts and the suits and they walk around and they sell the, the newspaper. Who knows what I'm talking about? Yeah. So and, and by the way, did you know that Louis Farrakhan lives in South Phoenix and I've been to his door three times on Soul Winning? He was never home, but I've been there three times. But I've spoken to his servants. I've preached the gospel unto uh, Louis Farrakhan's, uh, I don't want to call them servants. I'm, I'm, I'm getting all in Bible mode. But what uh, his employees there, I guess you'd call them in, in our modern vernacular. But uh, we've been there. Who's been to his house with me out soul winning? A couple, couple people. Been to his big mansion. It's funny because he lives in a very humble neighborhood. But he's got a big, you know, nice house and everything. And we talk to those servants and we have gone back and forth with them and given them the whole plan of salvation. And, and they'll tell you, we believe in the Bible and the Quran. And that's what the nation of Islam is. It is a mixing of Christianity and Islam. And it goes even beyond that because they will sit there and say that, hey, you know, all monotheistic religions of the world are all worshiping the same God. And they're very inclusive about, and, and they also were praising the Torah unto us, which, you know, is the first five books of the Bible. But they were saying that the Jews 
The Jews are wonderful also, and their religion is wonderful, and we can learn from them, and, and, and we all go back to the Torah. And they said, hey, Christianity, Islam, Judaism, we all agree on the Torah. You know, we all agree on Moses and stuff like that. So we're seeing more and more of these interfaith type movements and this, this uniting of various religions. I remember I was putting a fire alarm in a Catholic school one time, and lo and behold, I walked into the religion class in a Catholic school, and the teacher looked like kind of like a, a hippie kind of a guy, and he was teaching them about the Tao Te Ching, and he was teaching them Eastern mysticism as truth as I sat there and, and worked on the system. You know, I walked down the hall to the science class, and they're teaching evolution, you know. But anyway, all of these things are, are, are just signs of these religions coming together and putting aside differences and, and, hey, let's all agree on one thing. And on the surface, it can sound good, but that's not what the Bible teaches. Now, I got to hurry up because I, I really want to get in. This is the main thing I want to get into. Who is the Antichrist? What is the spirit of Antichrist? What is the focal point of this one world religion? Well, go to 1 John chapter 2 quickly. 1 John chapter 2. What is it that is going to identify this one world religion of the Antichrist? We don't have to wonder about it. It doesn't have to be a wild speculation. The Bible tells us the answer. Because it says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 22, Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? And let me point out that the word Christ means Messiah. Uh, over and over again, John 1, verse 41, for example, We have found the Christ, which being interpreted is the Messiah. You know, I know that when Messiah cometh, that is Christ, he'll show us all things. So what is this saying? Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Messiah? He's Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Now, what religion would be best identified by the denial that Jesus is the Messiah? Judaism. Because they're the ones who say, hey, there's a Messiah, it's not Jesus. They're denying that Jesus is the Messiah, and they deny the doctrine of the Father and the Son. That is the Antichrist. If one religion is the Antichrist... Now, a lot of people say, well, all false religions are against Christ. But wait a minute, that's not what Antichrist means. Antichrist means uh, in the place of... A guy who's coming in the place of Christ. Well, look, if you don't believe Jesus is the Messiah, you still believe another Messiah is coming. Of course that's the spirit of Antichrist. Because who's really coming? The Antichrist. And so Judaism is the Antichrist religion that says, hey... There's a Messiah out there, but it's not Jesus. You can't believe that Jesus is not the Messiah unless you believe that there is a Messiah. If you believe the Messiah doesn't exist, you can't believe that Jesus is not the Messiah because you don't believe in any Messiah. But if you say, well, there is a Messiah, it's not Jesus, that's Judaism, that's Antichrist. Now, this makes perfect sense that Judaism would be the focal point of this world religion because what is it that Islam, quote unquote, apostate Christianity and Judaism all have in common. Hey, we all, we all look back to the, the Old Testament, the Torah. You know, Muslims talk a lot about the Torah. We, of course, believe in the true Torah, Genesis through Deuteronomy, as found in our Bible here. And then, of course, you know, Judaism, oh, the Torah, even though they don't really follow any of it, but they claim to believe in the Torah. And this is basically going to be the religion upon which all these other religions are attached. Okay, so it's not going to be a situation of just, hey, it's going to be a brand new religion out of nowhere. No, it's going to be Judaism. The whole, the whole world, listen to me, listen to me now, the whole world is going to be brought into conformity with Judaism. That is the Antichrist religion. If we just look up the word Antichrist in the Bible, that's what we find a religion that denies that Jesus is Christ. That's why he calls them the synagogue of Satan in the book of Revelation. And in the book of Revelation, the term Jews is only mentioned twice. Both times it refers to them as the synagogue of Satan. Revelation chapter 2, verse 9, and Revelation verse, chapter 3, verse 9. Now, what's interesting, you say, okay, well, I can see how the Jews are bringing in these other faiths because of the fact that, for example, we see a mass movement in 2015. Listen to me, a huge movement of Christians finding their Hebrew roots. Right. 
it's huge. It's everywhere. I am 33 years old. I'm a young man, but I have never seen or heard of anything like this my entire life, except just in the past few years, this mass Hebrew roots movement. I don't remember this in the 80s. I mean, look, who, who can testify? I mean, do you, re Brother Garrett, do you remember a lot of talk about this in the 80s, 90s, of just everything's about going back to the Hebrew roots? And, but it's everywhere now. Everywhere it's like, oh, we got to get on the Hebrew calendar and the blood moons and the harbinger and Rabbi Jonathan Kahn and, oh, we've got to, you know, uh, get back to celebrating these feast days and Shabbat Shalom and getting us to know us. It is like never before being pushed. This Hebrew roots movement, it's everywhere you turn today, more than ever. And then you have on the Pentecostal side, this foaming at the mouth, John Hagee saying, hey, Jews don't have to believe in Jesus to be saved because they're saved under the Old Testament. And we're saved under the New Testament. Okay? So you got that with the charismatic. And by the way, did you know that about 18,000 people go to his church every Sunday? It's in a small movement. John Hagee, who gets up and says, don't evangelize the Jews. Don't give them the gospel. They don't have to believe in Jesus. They're already saved. 18,000 people come to his church. It's a huge, in San Antonio, Texas. I've talked to people who go there. Then you've got, just amongst other Christian groups, just this huge movement toward the Hebrew roots. And, the, and look, it also goes by this term, Torah-observing Christians. It's everywhere. When you go to the homeschool convention, it, it's the buzz amongst the homeschoolers. They're all into it. They're like, Whoa, where is this coming from? You say, okay, I can see how they're infiltrating Christianity big time when you've got the Israeli flag and the Star of Rem fan and all these other things being portrayed in Christian churches now. You, you say, well, you know, what about religions outside of, you know, Christianity, Islam, Judaism? You know, how's Judaism going to bring in the Buddhists and the Hindus? That seems a little far-fetched, Pastor Anderson. Oh, not at all. You apparently have never heard of the Jew booze. Okay, now this is a movement known as the Jew Boos, Jew Buddhist. Now, sometimes they're known as the Boo Jews. Okay, so you, you know, take your pick, Boo Jew, Jew Boo. Listen to this. Did you know that Jews only make up 2% of the American population, but that it is estimated that at least one third of Western Buddhists in America are Jewish by birth? So, Aside from all the Asians that are, obviously Asians are, are coming from Buddhist countries and so forth, but amongst, you know, translation, white people or black people that are Buddhists, it says one third of non-Asians that are Buddhists are Jews, even though they're only 2% of the population. Is that a little odd that there's just this huge percentage of them that are, that are these Jew boos? <laughs> Moreover... Many of the leading Buddhist teachers in America come from Jewish families, including Bernard Glassman, Sharon Salzberg, Joseph Goldstein, Jack Cornfield, Norman Fisher, Bhikkhu Bodhi, Natalie Goldberg, Tubton Kodrone, Sylvia Borstein, Allen Ginsberg, Lama Surya Das, just to name a few. And not only that, but more than one-fourth of the professors teaching Buddhism in American colleges and universities were born Jewish. So, hold on. It seems to me that Jews are a major force in Buddhism. They have taken over Buddhism and hijacked Buddhism, in a sense. Why? Because there's going to be a uniting of even Judaism and Buddhism. It's already happening. You know, you hear a lot about the ecumenical movement amongst Christians. And you hear a lot about the Chrislam and the Nation of Islam and the merging of the Bible and the Quran. And you see the Hebrew roots movement. And then you see even Jews saying, well, you know, Jesus isn't the son of God. He's not the savior of the world. But, you know, he was a Messiah. He was a good teacher. He was a good rabbi or whatever, and then, you know, just this merging. But even the Buddhists, my friend, are getting in on this, and they're being merged. It's all being brought together. Listen to what Rabbi Irving Greenberg said. 
The Dalai Lama taught us a lot about Buddhism, even more about Menschlichkeit, and most of all about Judaism. So here's what he's saying. The Dalai Lama taught us about Judaism. Are you listening? All tr as all true dialogue accomplishes, the encounter with the Dalai Lama opened us to the other's faith's integrity, equally valuable. The encounter reminded us of neglected aspects of ourselves, of elements in Judaism that are overlooked until they're reflected back to us in the mirror of what? Buddhism. So Buddhism is helping us understand Judaism. The Jew boos. <laughs> they are of Antichrist. In fact, I, I watched a thing recently of this guy, Rabbi Jeremy Gimpel. And this guy was speaking at Fellowship Bible Chapel at a non-denom Christian church. They bring in a Christ-rejecting rabbi that just flat out says, I don't believe in Jesus. And he let him speak for two hours. And this guy gets up and he's talking about... Uh, the Messiah, because they're saying, why don't you believe in Jesus? Some, you know, because he's like, ask me anything. Nothing offends me. So, of course, somebody asks him like, so, you know, why not believe in Jesus? And he's, you know, he tells them, well, you know, we don't believe in Jesus, not the Messiah and, and this and that. And then somebody else raised their hand and said, well, you know, I love you so much and you're so wonderful, thou special chosen one. But I'm just nervous that the Jews are going to believe in the Antichrist when he comes since they're still looking up for a Messiah. What do you think about that? I was thinking, like, that's a good question. <laughs> and, and this guy's like, well, you know, we don't have any prophecy of the Antichrist in, in the Old Testament or the Talmud, so I'm just not really worried about it. I don't believe in the Antichrist. But he said, I'll tell you this, though. He said, when a guy comes and unites the whole world and all religions of the earth accept him and believe on him and all nations believe on him, then I will bow down to him and say, you are the Messiah, you are the King of Israel, no matter who he is. Yeah. And he said, you know what, when that happens, he said, we'll say it's the first coming, you'll say it's the second coming, but you know what, it won't even matter. He literally, this is what he said, he said, you know, we're going to have some questions for the Messiah when he comes. You know, is this your first time or your second time here? And if he's smart, he won't answer us. He won't tell us if he's smart. Okay, and, and they're like, I don't have any problem. You think it was Jesus the first time? No problem. He's already, re they're already ready. The Jews are already saying, it's okay if you think it's his second time and we think it's the first time. As long as we're all rallying around him now, as long as he's brought peace now, as long as we're all uniting around him now. But he said the one enemy that has to be destroyed, he said, is radical Islam. And then we'll all be ready. This is what he said. He said, the messianic era is so close. Oh, we can taste it. It's so close, I can taste it. It's right there. It's right there. But he said, there's just one more enemy we have to destroy. Radical Islam. But here's the thing. How many Muslims are there in the world? Well, there are over a billion Muslims. I mean, Muslim, Muslims make up a huge population. But here's what he said. He said, well, it's, I don't, he said, it's not. And this, listen, this guy was foaming at the mouth about how bad you know, radical Islam is, and he was real upset about it. But let me tell you this, and of course I'm totally against Islam, but let me tell you this. He said, I don't want to get rid of Islam. He said, we don't need to get rid of Islam. He just said there just needs to be a different way of interpreting Islam where it's compatible and can coexist with Judaism. See, th that's the message today. It's not, hey, get rid of Islam, get rid of Christianity. No, 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 it's unite Christianity and Judaism and Islam and Buddhism and we're all going to join together. But listen, it's the dragon that's behind it. And you know what? If you're deceived by it, if you're deceived by it, the Bible, you know, what's the Bible saying? You're not even saved if you're deceived by it. But we see it creeping in. The Bible says the elect will not be deceived. But look, you can see how people could be fooled by this stuff, don't you? If they don't believe the Bible, they haven't studied it. So we see that all coming together. Now, just quickly, let's compare Jesus Christ versus the Antichrist as far as what he's going to do when he comes. Go to Psalm 2 quickly, Psalm chapter 2. So the message that Judaism is, and, and by the way, this guy wasn't some liberal this guy was an Orthodox Jewish rabbi. 
He was of one of the straightest sects. I mean, he had the fringes, he had the funny hat, and he was a, literally a, an important player. He's even a guy that, that is a political guy over there, and he's a player in the Israeli government. He's an orthodox rabbi. He's high up in a, in a couple different organizations and so forth. And even the most orthodox of the orthodox is saying, hey, we'll coexist with Islam. Hey, we're looking forward to joining with you Christians when our Messiah comes. I can't wait until the Jews and the Christians are all worshiping the same guy. So that's even the orthodox. Look, you talk to the liberal Jews, the reformed Jews, they're even more like, come on in, Buddhism. Come on in, Hindu. Come on in, homosexuality. Come on. It's great. It's wonderful. Look at Psalm 2, because let's see what the different, because what's the Antichrist going to do according to the Bible? All nations and tongues and kindreds will all be won over to him by the miracles, right? He'll do the miracles and they'll all worship him. He'll unite them all. Let me ask you something. Will Jesus at his second coming unite all religions and be believed on by all the world because of miracles? No, let's read what the Bible says in Psalm 2. We'll read the entire Psalm. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. See this uniting of rulers? This nation's coming together, it's against the Lord. They're uniting against Jesus. They're uniting against the Bible, okay? They want to unite and bring in wickedness, okay? And blasphemy and everything that is anti everything that, that we stand for. And, and God says it's in vain. You can't win. You're imagining a vain thing. They take counsel against the Lord and against his anointed. Now, the word anointed means Christ. This exact verse is quoted in Acts chapter 4. It says, take counsel against the Lord and against his Christ. Saying, so it's against the Lord and against his Christ, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Basically, this is that parable that Jesus told where they said, we will not have this man to rule over us. Refusing the Prince of Life, refusing the true Messiah, refusing the Lord Jesus Christ and his righteousness. We will not have this man to rule over us. Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Ask of me and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Does it sound like he's just going to come in, do some miracles and everybody's going to believe on him? That's what he, Now, the first time he came in, did miracles, was rejected. Many believed the words which he spake. But of course, by the nation as a whole, he was rejected. And so the Bible says here that when he comes back the second time, he's not going to come meek and lowly riding upon a, a, you know, a, a donkey, riding upon a colt, the foal of an ass. He's going to show up the second time in wrath and vengeance to punish the earth. Yeah. And he will set up his kingdom and he will rule with a rod of iron. He's not going to sit at the negotiating table with Islam, Buddhism, and Judaism. It's not going to happen. He's not bringing Judaism and Buddhism and Hinduism all together. And here's the thing. You say, well, how are Hinduism and Buddhism going to unite? They're already so similar. You know, they're, they're, these Eastern religions are all connected. Okay. He says, ask of me and I shall give thee. I mean, the Lord just gives it to The Lord just gives the kingdom of the world to Christ. You know, it, it's all in his power. Jesus said, all power is given unto me. He's going to rule with the rod of iron. Look at verse 10. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Amen. So Jesus Christ is not coming to unite the religions of the world. He's actually coming to destroy all false religion and to destroy the armies of the Antichrist, and to just wipe them out. 
And, and he just has the power to do it by pouring out his wrath supernaturally. He's not going to come and take power and, you know, die and, and come back again. He's already done that the first time. He's going to come in and he's going to destroy false religion. What is the Lord Jesus Christ kingdom going to look like? You know what? It's going to be a kingdom of righteousness and godliness. And it's going to be a kingdom where he rules with a rod of iron. It, and, and look, it's not saying that he's ruling, you know, with a wet spaghetti noodle. He's ruling with a rod of iron. He's going to break these nations in pieces like a potter's vessel. He's not coming with something. And here's what's so funny. People think he comes and he's going to be this soft leader that's just going to be like, yeah, uh, you know, open sodomy and, and, and just total permissiveness. No. Remember all those laws that everybody hates from the Old Testament? Oh, so strict. What do you think he's going to be ruling with? Is he going to roll out some whole new law? No, it's, it's going to be the type of laws that you see in the Old Testament. Why? Because it was perfect. And it's, it's so funny that we think in our minds as Christians often that he's just going to show up and turn everything into a big United States of America. <laughs> like he's going to have a Congress and a Senate and it's going to be like all this prison industrial complex and everything. No, it's going to be all the punishments that are in the Bible. Mm -hmm. That's what's going to be meted out. And, you know, some of you, if you want to rule and reign with Jesus Christ, need to figure that out. Or else he's going to be like, well, you know, I don't know how high of an authority I can give you. You, you know, you don't even understand my law. Yeah. Right. I mean, think about it. You know, if you want to rule and reign, you better understand his laws right. in order to rule justly. At least you'll have some time up in heaven to get some remedial training. Take, uh, you know, law 101 up there when you get there. But look, I'll just close with it. What's the master plan? What's the title of the sermon? The title of the sermon is, the devil's master plan for the end times. What's he doing? Well, we can see what he's doing financially. We can see what he's doing politically. This globalism, this internationalism. But what's he doing spiritually? He's bringing all religions together. And when you see a spirit of, hey, let's bring in the rabbi and start learning stuff from Judaism, that's the worst. Right. Because that is the... That is actually, you know, on that wheel of all these different false religions of Antichrist, you know, the spoke would be that star of Remphan. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if the mark of the beast is, a, is that star. Because it's a perfect 666. Because it's, it's six points and, you know, six triangles. And it's made by drawing six lines. I mean, it, it could easily be that simple. Wouldn't surprise me one bit at all if that were the symbol. And, you know... Christians are so gaga about the Hebrew roots, they'd just be so excited to finally get to have their, you know, Star of David tattoo, you know, or whatever. Just, oh, this, this is how I show my support for Israel, you know. And, and you know, I don't know. I'm not going to try to speculate about that. But the bottom line is, this spirit of Antichrist that's already in the world, the mystery of iniquity is already working. It's to unite Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Buddhism, Hinduism. You know, that's why we hear Christians talk so much about karma. It's not karma. It's called whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Why don't we use the Bible's term? Hey, it, you hear Christians talk about nirvana. It's heaven. You know, where, where do we get this Eastern mysticism coming in? You know, this spirit that wants to just bring in all this junk from other religions and bring in all their junk and try to import it into Christianity. That is the spirit of Antichrist. And when it's coming from Judaism, it's double Antichrist. Right. Amen. And so we need to keep our doctrine pure. This is the only book, the Bible. No Tao Te Ching, Quran, none of it. You know, the Bible, period. End of story. And by the way, this teaching out there that says, oh, intelligent design. I'm sick of intelligent design. It's Jesus' design. Amen. I'm sick of people talking about God and the Lord without using the name of Jesus. Amen. Because it's the name of Jesus that there's no other name under heaven given among men Amen. whereby we must be saved. Amen. And when you hear somebody just talking about God, 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 the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, intelligent design, no, it's not intelligent design. 
It's Jesus spake and created all things. According to Colossians 1, all things were created by Jesus. According to John chapter 1, all things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. And so rallying around creationism with Jews and other religions who just believe in intelligent design, you know, that's why I don't, I'm not going to get all excited about, and I've never seen this, but everybody talks about this movie with Ben Stein. Called, what's it called? Yeah. Expelled. Expelled. And, you know, it, it shows how there's an agenda to make sure that all the public school kids are brainwashed with, with uh, evolution, I guess. And I guess it's a film exposing how any scientist who comes out in favor of intelligent design, you know, is basically being uh, exiled from the scientific community, blackballed, can't succeed. You know, that doesn't surprise me. I'm sure that that's true. But I'll tell you what, I wouldn't give you a nickel for that movie because it's made by a Jew. Hey, oh, that's racist. It's not a race, it's a religion. Ben Stein is a white dude, and so am I. So, you know, am I being accused of being racist against white people? I'm white. Is there any doubt about the fact that I'm white? Okay, well then why am I accused of being racist against white people? You know, that's just a cover that they play of when you point out the lies of their religion. I don't want to watch a movie by a guy who, who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Oh, but he's for intelligent design. But guess what? Guess what? People were going to hell long before evolution was ever even come up with because evolution is a new teaching from the 1800s. Oh, if we could just defeat evolution, we're going to get everybody saved. No, because... People didn't, and by the way, intelligent design isn't even saying that evolution's not true. Because a lot of them will believe in like a theistic, well, well, it's intelligent, he designed evolution. Yeah. <laughs> right? No, it's garbage. We don't believe in intelligent design. We don't believe in theistic evolution. We believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is our creator and he's our God. There's no salvation in any other. He created this world and this world is not millions of years old. That is a fraud from the devil. You say, well, how do you know? Show me the science. I, the Bible. Amen. Oh, you just believe that book. Yes! Amen. Oh, so, oh, so you, you teach your kids about science? I'm going to teach my kids the Bible. This is the true word of God. This is the science. This is all knowledge that I need. Right. Ah, you're just an imbecile because you don't understand Star Trek and Star Wars. No, I don't need, <laughs> I don't need the science falsely so-called. And you know what the Bible says? Avoid oppositions of science falsely so-called. Right. I don't feel, you know what? I know that the Bible is true Amen. by the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Not because of any fossil that I've discovered. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, that we're saved through, through the blood of, of the Lord Jesus. And Lord, help, help that name to be on our lips, Lord, where, where we don't just talk in vagueness about God like we're a politician, but that we actually use the name of Jesus. And Lord, when we get around Jews, help us not to just all of a sudden, you know, stop using the name Jesus and just switch to God so that we can all rally around it. Lord, help these Hebrew roots teachings not to slip into our church because, honestly, we are uh, different than these other religions and we need to stay separate from them. And if our nation were, were, were following you, we would stay separate from the other nations of the world and not be a part of this conglomerate that is against the Lord and against his anointed. And, Father, help us to be wise and to know the times and to be awake and to watch and be sober, and to understand the book that you titled Revelation because you wanted us to understand what you have revealed, not concealed. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen.